Welcome to chapter four of Soil Science and Management. Today we're going to talk about the physical properties of the soil and, and how they affect growing and uh, uh, <clears throat> what plants can uh, look for in, in the physical properties. Today we're going to be able to talk about soil texture and how that's important to the uh, soil and we're going to be able to take that texture and identify it by using a sample of soil. Also, we're going to discuss uh, permeability and structure, and we will talk about some other physical characteristics that have to do with soil as well. So these are not the chemical or biological uh, uh, portions of the soil. This, the physical properties of the soil are the things that you can see and feel. A lot of times we uh, handle the soil and we can determine what types of materials are in the soil just by feeling how they, uh, how we interact with them and touching them is a, is a great way to understand your soil and to uh, feel some of the deficiencies or types of, of soil that you have in your, in your, uh, in your area. There are three main uh, different soils or textures in your soil and, and they are large, medium, and small. And the large particles are your sand particles. These range in size from approximately two millimeters all the way down to 0 0.05 millimeters in size. And these are obviously your coarsest and largest proper, largest particles and can offer the best drainage. You have silt in the middle, which would be your medium, uh, size particles and those range in size from 0 0.05 millimeters all the way down to 0 0.002 millimeters. Um, and then beyond that you have uh, clay particles which are even smaller. So <clears throat> having different particle sizes can affect different things in the soil. Namely the first one is surface area and this is evidenced by uh, if you were to look at say a clay soil versus a sandy soil it's hard to understand always what which of these soils would have more surface area just because of the the amount of particles that are in a clay soil those clay soils have a larger surface area i know i, I had a hard time understanding this when i was in school too it's not about the amount of surface area per particle, but once you start to multiply and extrapolate those surface areas through the whole soil, it becomes more and more and more. And one thing this does is it increases uh, a something called the CEC or the cation exchange capacity. And we're going to discuss this later when we talk about fertility, but you'll know and, and something to take away from today is the clay soils they hold on to things a lot tighter because of this surface area, because they have more ability and, and more particles per, uh, you know, say square inch or cubic inch, I guess I should say, they're able to hold on to things tighter. And, and water is one of those things that they hold on to tighter. And that's why certain clay soils can have uh, moisture in them, but they are not able to, uh, this, the plants are not able to access that moisture because it's being held on to so tightly. And, we're going to talk about that a lot, but I just wanted to kind of focus on that for just a minute. When we look at these different particle sizes, we have to take into account macro pores and micro pores. So these different pores are different based on which particles you're using. The uh, macro pores, these are those pores that are going to hold on to that water and the, and the oxygen that plants have access to. These are going to be larger spaces within the soil, larger spaces within the particles, and they're going to be able to um, have materials that, that the plants can access. When we talk about micropores, those are much smaller pores, and these pores are very similar to what I was referring to in the clay soils, and a lot of times these micropores hold on to things a lot tighter. When we Look at the two differences in pores. Uh, micropore would be the small area between two particles. A macropore would be the area between 
groups of particles. So that's the kind of the difference. When you have clumps of soil in the ground, the macro pores are the areas in between the clumps and the micro pores are the areas in between the little particles within the clumps. So these different uh, particles are called soil separates and they can be separated out to determine what your soil consists of. Uh, many times we look at a soil and we want to determine what type of soil we have and if it's if it's good for growing if it's good for uh, building we have to look at these different classes and understand how they move how they operate what's very important to their functionality within the soil so the sand is those coarser materials and don't hold a whole lot of structure they can't you can't build a house on a strictly sand it would just float away uh, whereas clay, clay becomes very difficult to grow your plants in and it's harder to uh, have aeration, it's harder to move water through. So, so each one of these has a, a purpose and we have to understand which areas have these things so we can understand the correct purpose for all these areas. Uh, so sand again is the largest of the soil separates and this is composed mostly of, of weathered quartzite and other minerals. Um, the particles do range in size from the two millimeters down to 0.5 millimeters. Um, as I said in the beginning, sand with its having larger pore spaces and more macro pores, it allows water to infiltrate more readily and something you'll see when you are growing plants or, or looking at the way water permeates and infiltrates through a, a sandy soil is the sand will permeate down in a channel. It'll go straight down. It will not spread across the top. It will just start to infiltrate straight down. This can be good and can be bad. Um, having infiltration like that is great for um, plants for roots to follow it. Unfortunately, that's, that water leaves through those channels a lot faster, so you have to water more frequently in a sandy soil. Um, when you have a lot of sand in your soil, unfortunately, it does not hold on to water and nutrients very readily. So again, you have to fertilize more and you have to water more. Uh, one thing we use sand for is uh, in the golf course industry is, is growing grass in the greens. And this is because we don't want the greens soil to hold on to bad minerals or bad nutrients, i.e. salts and things that can affect the root growth in bent grass or other types of sensitive grasses. These grasses are able to grow the way they grow because of the refreshing and changing out of those nutrients on a regular basis. And if we were to allow these materials and these particles to hold on to bad constituents, then that grass would struggle in growing. Moving forward to silt, um, sometimes if you hear a soil being described, uh, you may hear the word loam. And in loam and silt are not a synonym of each other, but when you have silt within your soil, it changes its name to a loamy soil. These are the medium sized soil particles and these go from approximately 0.5 millimeters down to 0 0.02 millimeters. Uh, they can be very, very silky and powdery, almost like talcum powder. And uh, typically when you see dust storms or wind storms with a lot of particles in them, it's the silt that is being separated out and being picked up. Um, sand is, is heavier and it's harder to be picked up by wind but the silt is able to be readily picked up and moved. And the fi final uh, particle is clay. This is gonna be the smallest of all the soils. This is from 0 0.02 millimeters and below. Uh, these are very, very small, and it's very, very difficult to see one clay particle with the naked eye. 
to to be able to see clay particles you need to use a magnifying glass or something like a microscope to see clay particles readily they are so small they uh they just they clump together and when you look at clay most more often than not you're looking at multiple clay particles something uh something to try and, and we're going to do this in a, in a lab later on in the class is to take a, a random soil sample and you can look at the three different particles by putting that soil sample in a water bottle you fill it up with water as you uh, uh, mix the, the particles with the water, you shake the bottle and placing it down on a table, you can start to see the different particles separate out. Uh, the sand being the heaviest will separate out first and it will create a layer on the top of the bottle. Uh, secondly, you will have the silt come through and you can see the different size of the particles. You can see the sand having larger, coarser grains and then you can see the silt settle out and having smaller and smaller, more powdery like grains. And then at the very end, you'll notice that the clay does not settle out um, because the clay is such a small particle. It's not dense enough to settle itself into to uh, to settle down into uh, the, the soil where the rest of the soil is. It will actually stay suspended within the water. Talking about the uh, soil textural triangle, there are uh, 12 different textural classes that are shown in this triangle, and I'm going to do a lab based on, on how to use this triangle and, and so you can see how to operate this. But when we, when we look at our soils, we look at them based on percentages of the three different soil particles that they, they have. Uh, first, we have uh, the sand, the silt, and the clay, and we take a look at all of those different uh, particles and the amounts at which they are within the soil, and we can determine what type of soil we have. And then we can go back and we can understand how to operate that soil the, the best way possible. We can understand how to uh, uh, water, how to use nutrients. When we understand what soil we have, then we know what methods and things we need to do to operate within that soil. So when we look at them, again, these fine, medium, and coarse soils, obviously fine is going to be your uh, clays, mediums will be a mix of clays and sands, and then the coarse will be heavily sandy soils. These all affect the way we have uh, infiltration. As I said, with the sandy soil, those coarser soils, we have this, this very thin column of water as it goes down. And the difference being with a fine soil, you start to see the water spread along the top of the soil and then go down and it spreads and continues to spread. It doesn't infiltrate straight down like a sandy soil and it holds on to that water more tightly. So pros and cons not just saying one soil is better than another it's how you manage those soils to make them better sand can be great for certain applications where we want that water to move through the system quickly and to not affect the way the plants and other materials are held onto in the soil but then again clay can also be used to its advantage because we will be able to hold on to more materials more nutrients we'll be able to hold on to that water a little longer we don't want to grow in clay we don't want to grow in sand. We want to grow somewhere in the middle. We want to look for that sandy loam, that sandy clay loam, that sandy loamy clay, something like that, where we can have a little bit of everything. We can have a little bit of, of different materials to hold on to different items that we put into our soil. When we start to look at soil density and permeability, these are going to be super important things that we discuss in this class and uh, uh, namely uh, particle density and bulk density. These are, are going to determine how much of that soil is, is in one area or one part of the soil. So we look at a, a bulk part of the soil and we'll be able to determine what the different soil densities are. Once we have the understanding of the particle density and the bulk density, we can start to look at soil porosity and permeability. 
And uh, these are the soil porosity is the amount of pore space or air and water that are within that soil. So we can determine how much of that soil can hold on to things. And then permeability is going to be the ease at which that air and water move throughout the soil. And if we have uh, low permeability, then we have a harder time for our plants to grow. The last two, the porosity and the permeability can be greatly affected by something called compaction. And this is when we are uh, walking over, driving over, operating machinery on top of soil. And as we compact and press that soil, we continue, we can continually lose porosity and permeability because the particles in the pore space, particles become closer together and the pore space becomes less and less and less. And when we lose um, that air and that airspace and that water, we're not able to hold on to those nutrients and we're not able to have uh, a great soil for growing. So when we start to look at soil structure, we look at um, clumps and these are going to form your aggregates or your, or your clods and your peds not super important but these are some of the way that we can classify different soils and, and how those different things are acting together and how soil um, how we can t t start to break this up uh, we don't want to have a lot of of these soil clumps we want to have a nice smooth more uh, homogeneous soil where we have it all kind of mixed together we don't want to have you know these soils over here like maybe we have clay in this area and then we have sand over in this area it, it becomes very difficult to operate say a golf course or a landscape area when you have multiple different soil types very very close to each other because we have to adjust our irrigation we have to adjust our, our fertility if we can have one consistent type of soil and we can uh, manage that soil mechanically then we'll be further ahead when we're trying to grow Into one more sorry guys uh, <clears throat> when we're talking about the different soil structures we can look at the different horizons and see different types of structure within those horizons the uh, the a horizons like we talked about last uh, last class or a couple of lectures ago it has a granular structure these e horizons have a more platy structure the b horizons have a very blocky structure and then those B and C can be prismatic and, and crystalline type structure. So when we form a soil structure, it, it's a basically a two-step process, and we start to create those peds, and and these are these different aggregations of soil that that are throughout the area. And the second part of that soil that comes together will help cement it together. And if we look at soil in nature, they are actually uh, quite firm and, you know, we can walk on, on most soil that has been in nature for a, for a long time because the soil has created a cement-like material that holds it all together. They, this makes them very strong. When we start to manage them, we start to till them, we start to disc them, we start to do different things with these soils, we can actually break down that soil structure and we can, over time, we can actually damage the soil. So, uh, you know, operating a rototiller is great if you want to use it to do certain things, but continually mixing that soil up can be harmful to that soil because you can continually do damage and mixing and mixing and mixing and making that soil very weak. So when we talk about soil consistence, we have uh, the, this is going to go back right into that uh, compaction is when we start to have soil stick to, an, to one another, it can really be a detriment to the soil. And this can be really evident within a clay soil because you can see how tightly those can get packed. And, and we can even have this in other soils, the more moist, the more moisture that can be found within those soils, 
This is happening because as that moisture is in the soil particles, it actually starts to lubricate the soil particles and allows them to flow into different areas. And when we are, say, compacting in, uh, we'll say, road construction, we actually want to get that soil to about 95% saturation. And once we have it at that 95%, it's the best for it to be able to be compacted. So we, we can have a strong base if we want to compact the soil, but we have to be very careful if we want to grow and operate that soil for plants or, or trees or any other materials. Because once we have compacted soils, it's very hard to uncompact soils. It becomes a lot of mechanical work, a lot of extra rototilling, aeration. Um, there's a lot of machinery that you have to bring in to release a lot of that pressure out of the soil. So when we look at these, the different soil types, you have um, wet soil, and that's going to be where it's very sticky and, and hard and, and put together. You have moister soils, which is going to be loose but firm, and then you have drier soils, and this will be, you can definitely tell drier soils because it will almost crumble and crack and crush. Getting into soil tillage, this is going to be your uh, mechanical means of breaking up soil or changing and managing your soil. And these can be good. These can help to improve your soil up to a point. Again, as I stated earlier, you don't want to overdo it when you're talking about tilling your soil because it can actually start to degrade. You want to keep some of those soil clumps within your soil because that holds on to nutrients and materials but you do want to break up a lot of them so that your roots have an area in which to grow through. Uh, if we look back into history, we didn't always have rototillers or mechanical means to uh, operate these, these, machine, these, these planting areas, but even just turning over with a shovel will allow some of those clods to be broken up and to give an area for those roots to grow through. So just like water, roots want to grow through the easiest way possible, and they're going to go look for the path of least resistance. And the cracks and the different macro pores within the soil are how those plants are and those roots are going to grow through. So we've talked a lot about compaction, but I just want to kind of go over some of the issues that you can face with compaction. And this is namely going to be uh, reducing your porosity and your permeability. You're going to reduce the ability for your air exchange. And, and within this, you're going to reduce the ability for your plants to take potassium. Uh, potassium does not move readily within the soil. So a plant has to find that potassium within the soil. It has to be able to uh, infiltrate its root system into the areas where that potassium persists. And then it will be able to take that potassium up into the plant. It doesn't flow, it doesn't dissolve, it doesn't move around within the soil like other nutrients do, so that becomes an issue. We look at de decreased infiltration rates, and this is going to be a problem because we can't get water where it needs to go, and uh, we will end up having pooling or puddling on top of the water, on top of the soil surface, and this can create other issues uh, such as ana an anaerobic conditions or an increased. Uh, a bacteriological uh, constituency. When we compact a soil, we actually will increase the erosion of that soil because it will not hold on to water readily. It won't have the correct pore space to hold on to things. And as wind storms come through, it will be able to blow off the top layers of the soil and create a lot of, of issues for erosion. When we're talking about managing, physical managing of these properties, we want to avoid aggregate destruction. So we want to, we don't want to uh, uh, rototill this soil so hard that we are breaking down this actual soil structure. We want to make sure that we are we are operating this machinery so that the soil can become a stronger soil 
and not have as many issues as we had before, breaking up small portions of the soil in order for plants to grow more readily. We want to ensure that we're not having puddling and clods where we're having these groups of this aggregate that are gonna cause the detriment. We wanna break them up just so, so that we can have a proper soil. We can do all this as we till by uh, reducing the amount of, of clods or these piles of soil within the, within the area. And as we use uh, tilling, we can remove surface crusting by allowing water and having moisture to be more prevalent within the soil and allowing the whole horizon of the soil to hold on to water. So we don't wanna have a dry top layer and a moist bottom layer because this can actually create a detriment to the soil. As we have surface crusting, that will start to create erosion capability and have other issues that arise from it. Plants don't want to grow where the soil isn't isn't uh, isn't a strong moist soil throughout the horizons. So when we talk about these channels, these are what I was speaking about earlier when it talked when we talk about water movement and and plant root movement. Uh, water has water when it moves it wants to move with the area of least resistance and when we talk about water moving through a soil it flows through these channels these pore spaces and it flows into different areas as we have these different areas these different channels these different um, larger pore spaces we we start to have roots that will follow these channels and will follow the water and will follow the nutrients. Sometimes we can develop these harder layers, some they're called pans, and these will actually uh, stop the flow of water. They can create perched water tables. They can uh, create difficulty with plant roots trying to grow through them, and they can become very difficult. They're not, impermeable layers but they're semi impermeable layers the water can move through these but it's very slowly and it takes a long time for the water to move through so if you're watering too much and you have a pan you start to fill this area up with water and if you have a root zone within this water table this perched water table those roots can become rotted and we can have problems now the main types of these pans, we have clay pans, fragipans, plinthite, excuse me, caliche, and durapans. Um, many of you have probably dealt with caliche here in, in Southern California. We, we have quite a bit of that here. Um, and kind of an interesting note is caliche is actually not a, uh, not a, a clay. Caliche is a sand with a calcium cement that is holding it together. I have a ton of caliche in my backyard and I have to infiltrate my soils for almost several days before I can start to dig holes to put in trees. I have a, a fairly healthy orchard at this point, but it's taken a lot of work and a lot of very slow uh, watering practices to make sure that caliche is kind of broken down and, and moved around. Soil temperature can be really important and this can actually be affected by the amount of, uh, by your physical characteristics of the soil. And this has to do with the soil heating up. It's just like concrete. Um, obviously concrete gets hotter than, than say even the dirt or grass because it has tighter particles so when we're talking about like a clay it has less insulation to hold the temperature uh, more consistent when we're talking about sands or, or or soils that have water held in them those can create more insulation and they can actually heat up less something that the soil temperature can do for physical properties is become an issue for, for managing. And 
we need to understand just some of those ways to manage that soil temperature. Uh, we can do that through watering. We can do it through mulching or adding in organic material. Um, we can cover it or we can use inorganic materials. We can add in different soil particles to change the amount of soil we have. The physical prop to, to change the, the physical properties of the soil. Um, and lastly, we talk about soil color, and uh, soil color doesn't necessarily affect the way we use it to grow, but it can be used physical property within the soil to determine what the parent material of that soil was and what's in the soil, how much organic matter is in that soil. Uh, when you look at certain soils, we'll, we'll talk about, say, there's red clays that are through all throughout Arizona, and uh, that is very indicative of the parent material being these red colored rocks that were developed and as they degrade over time, they they turn into this red clay soil. So we can we can determine sometimes where soil comes from based on the color of it, and and this is going to come by what's in that soil. To summarize this chapter, we talked a lot about uh, soil texture and how that affects different things. Um, we talked about how those different three particles, the sand, the silt, and the clay, can uh, work with permeability. We also talked about soil tillage and compaction, and we talked about temperature and color of those soils. So understanding all of these different physical properties of a soil helps us to better understand how those soils can hold on to things in the future, can how, how we need to manage those soils, it's very difficult to change the physical properties of a soil, but we can do things to improve infiltration, permeability, and porosity. Before I let you go, I want to just talk about, as I say, that's very difficult to change this. One thing we do as, as turf grass managers in the golf course industry is we, we try to add sand to certain areas if we're having infiltration issues. And this can be seen on golf greens when we top dress with sand. This can be done for many reasons, but usually we're trying to improve the soil texture and, and give us a greater permeability and more porosity within that soil. So like I said, it's hard for us to change the physical properties of a soil but we're able to slightly manage those properties and, and change them so that we can make them a little bit easier for us to manage. So thank you, and I will see you next time.